just ask me the basics. Um, I first heard about resveratrol in the States and uh, at a lecture by a guy called um, Joseph Marone, who's a doctor for the Pittsburgh, I think the Pittsburgh Steelers. And, and you're at these anti-aging conferences and you hear about things which really, it's all the things that you hear about healthy aging, but here was a lecture promising extended, extended life based on this small molecule, resveratrol. And so in a very sort of self-absorbed way, I got very excited about it and thought that it's going to be the be-all and end-all. Um, and basically what I'd like to do today is just go through the history of the research for you. And, and that's how I'm going to sort of talk about it. We'll go through the research, we'll look at it together, and we can come to our own conclusions on whether we think it's going to be the thing of the future or we've run out of batteries, or if it's not. So I've got no um, commercial interest in any of the things I'm going to be talking about today. Resveratrol is a, it's a small molecule present in red wine, and it's, it's basically manufactured by plants in times of stress. When they started first doing research on resveratrol, um, they went to, and this is in the United States, they went to, um, was it? Oh, fantastic, thanks. Okay. They, they went to um, the drought-stricken areas of uh, South Australia to use the distressed red wine grapes that had been suffering because of uh, drought, because they had the highest concentration of, res of resveratrol. And that's the, the high-grade resveratrol they used in all of the studies. So that's interesting that they came back to Australia. And it, along with other 18 polyphenols produced by plants, were produced in times of stress to modify the plant gene. Um, it's called a SIR genes, and the group in them are called sirtuins. And, and basically under times of stress. So in Australia, I mean, so then we wondered whether there had any relationship to what they call the French paradox. And this is early thinking. I'm giving you the reason the early history here, so you know some of this is antiquated and towards the end we'll get to the, the today stuff. But the French paradox was really why do the French eat as much fatty foods as the Americans that tend to live longer and is it because they've got, um, you know, they're drinking red wine, is it due to the total milligram of, the milligrams of polyphenols in the, in the actual red wine, not just resveratrol? And I think that's an important point which we'll come up with later. It may not just be resveratrol. So the history of the research. Well, the, the first thing to say is that, and all of this is based on, calorie restriction being the one proven, possible one proven thing to extend life. So a calorie restriction for a 70 kilogram man of about 1,100 calories per day will give you physiological signs uh, of, of extended life and probably extend your life somewhere between 25 to 30%. But you know, that's not really consistent with, um, with a normal lifestyle to only be eating 1,100 calories per day. So, so this was the initial research that showed it. And then we've got a whole myriad of, of, of timelines here of different, different things that were tested and over the different years. And I'll just go through some of those individually. In science in 2000, um, you know, the discovery of this resveratrol activating the CERT1 DNA um, was, was an exciting thing and it replicated some of the calorie restriction uh, diet signs. In nature, it was also shown then that resveratrol was the best of the polyphenols to stimulate the CERT1 gene, um, more than quercetin and, and some of the others. And then in fruit flies and roundworms in 2004, they showed the extension. And then the most important sort of paper that came out was in 2005, and that was by uh, a Harvard University uh, scientist called Dr. David Sinclair. But the interesting thing about Dr. David Sinclair, and that's what got me you know, interested in it when you're over in the States, is David Sinclair is a Sydney uh, scientist. And he, in fact, got to Harvard University through applying for a, a scholarship or a grant, and he was knocked back because he was not from the US, and he persisted and he persisted. He got to be in the, uh, you know, the running for the program, and he actually won the, you know, won the Harvard Prize to go and do research at Harvard University. And he's the main man, when, when you look at resveratrol um, research, he's one of the main people involved, in it, and I'll mention his name as we go through. Um, so he produced this paper in 2005, which sort of explained how the novel substances might, um, might make changes to the cells. 
And once again, I've got a more uh, advanced look at the hypothesis in the, later, in the later diagrams. But this is what happened in 2005. We felt that the calorie restriction and other biological stresses um, increased cell defences. They reduced cellular damage and mutations. Um, and, and you can see the other things that, that were shown as a, uh, as a result of calorie restriction or taking resveratrol. And then in 2006, this was the, the landmark, this is the landmark test and uh, paper that was put out. It was, it was shown that warm-blooded mammals, um, there was calorie, calorie restriction and resveratrol had similar, uh, had similar applications. And it was mainly in warm-blooded mouse that were given a high calorie diet. And what, what it showed was resveratrol increased insulin sensitivity. It also increased AMP, which is a metabolic regulator of insulin sensitivity. It increased mitochondrial numbers and it increased motor function of these, of these mouse. It's also interesting that it uh, showed that it decreased glucose and also the organ pathology. When they cut open the, the livers of the two sets of mice, they had the mice who were on a high calorie diet and had the mice who were on a high calorie diet and resveratrol. And the livers of the high calorie diet and resveratrol looked more like a normal standard diet liver. So it reduced the fatty deposits in the liver and in other organs. And when they say increased mitochondrial numbers, they increased mitochondrial numbers in heart muscle, in, um, in, in the brain, and in skeletal muscle. And that was probably through um, PC, PGC1 alpha, which is also increased. And another sign of ageing, which, uh, which is, was decreased amylase as well, shown by these, uh, by these effects. So this is the, this is the sort of the, the, the fantastic sort of data that was shown from the 2006 study. At the top, we look at actual body weight. And you can see that the, the mouse that were put on standard diet, they had a low body weight. But the, but the mouse that were put on high calorie and high calorie diet and resveratrol, they actually had the, exactly the same weight. So resveratrol didn't change the body weight of these mice. Even though it had other positive effects, the actual body weight wasn't changed. The second graph there, if you can see it, it shows the uh, survival time of mice. And at the top, the black and the, uh, black and the blue are the, the mouse who are on high calorie diet and resveratrol and a standard diet. They live towards 110 weeks. They live 31% longer than the, the mice who were just put on a high calorie diet. So that's the, that was the crucial evidence at the time that you know, something spectacular was happening with resveratrol. And then also we talk about quality of life of the mice. Quality of life of human beings can be extrapolated as they do later on. And the way to measure a quality of life is their, their latency on a rotor rod. And you can see on the standard diet that these mice, as they got older, so the, the four different things are showing they're getting older, they actually improved their, how long they could last on the, on the rotor rod. The, the mice who just had a high calorie diet, well, they never did very much, very well at all. But the interesting thing about it is that when you look at the third group, who are on a high calorie diet and resveratrol, they actually, as they got older, they improved. They improved their, their uh, function and improved their quality of life. So some, some interesting data that came out of that, and there's been subsequent papers to that. So. So now the race was on to develop um, you know, something that might be more potent than resveratrol, perhaps synthetic type um, molecules that are similar to resveratrol but more powerful in the ageing cell that was, that was what they described. Synthetically made activators which could stimulate the CERT1 gene a thousand times more than resveratrol. And in 2007, Sinclair again came up and he tested molecules and then he found that these molecules, which we'll talk about later on, they improved insulin sensitivity, they lowered glucose, and they increased the mitochondrial capacity. So 